welcome to the show, Joseph. Thanks for having me. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I am so excited to have you here. I mean, we haven't had too many companies like yours on the show, actually, and it's always nice to talk about something different. Meet new people and explore different avenues to success for our listeners. So let's dive right in. Let's start by giving us an overview before we move on to, you know, the specific services that you offer, your ethos and so on. Broadly, what do you do at Xenov and how do you help your customers? Great question. Um, we help our companies scale their business. Um, and we provide around the clock support 365 days a year while saving them anywhere in the range of 50 to 80% of their operational expenses. Wow. Um, we're providing back office support for them so they can focus on um, other things and so they can become more obsessed with their customers and grow and build their brand and partnership. I love that because obviously customer experience is a huge part of your customer's business and them getting return business and things like that. But what we're really talking about right now is outsourcing. Is that correct? Like this is, this is what you guys do is, is outsourcing for other companies. Yeah, we're an extension of their business. So when we're talking, it's it's people fully dedicated to their team. So we're just an extension of their business as though we're employed by them. So we have that same passion and drive to help them grow and develop as, as they need fit. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. So where did the where did the company name come from? How did it get started? Um, me and my partners were just talking. It's just a climax reaching the pinnacle and a lot of organizations hit that hump where they can't, you know, grow exponentially, both small, medium, and large. So we're saying, how can we help these organizations kind of climb and, and reach that pinnacle where we can support them? Awesome. And the name, where does the name come from? Xenoff BPO. Well, BPO is business process, out, you know, outsourcing, and Xenoff is just uh, the pinnacle, the climax of a, like thinking of climbing a mountain. Oh, I love that. I always like to get an idea of where, you know, the organization's names come from because there's always usually, you know, a lot of thought that goes into it and some discussion around it and really just figuring out what words really are going to reflect what you want to do in business. So I appreciate you for sharing that. So you offer a range of services all the way from accounting to supply chain management. So can we dive a little bit deeper into each of those to get a real feel for exactly how you can help? Of course, uh, we, for some organizations, again, regardless if let's take the, the supply chain part you mentioned, um, some companies come to us and they fully outsource, whether it's an importer, um, a carrier, a trucker, a freight forwarder, or an ocean carrier. And some of them say, Hey, you know, we have a team and we need to look to support this function or anything from start to finish. So think of a supply chain PO creation to, to booking, to carrier, to creating the file, to build. So we do everything. So some people come to us and say, hey, I need you know, 25, I need 50 bodies. But we take one process at a time and we start piloting to integrate properly. So like hiring any new person, it's a slow transition. We're not saying we can start tomorrow. It's creating real you know, achievable metrics where we can drive and, and build success together. Um, things that are not achievable or realistic, we say we can't do. But again, yeah, it's, 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 it's taking any component of the business and working on that, that function. It, it could be anything, um, as you mentioned, the accounting part two, where we're working on finance and accounting and collections and working through that uh, auditing process to make sure bills are being sent out to customers, the collections being done, any disputes on it. Because again, sometimes we're, we're auditing files and saying that, you know, hey, a trucker charged the wrong rate, going back for a dispute and building parameters that meet the customer's key performance indicators to drive performance because the, the big thing with outsourcing is um, the time to do things and people were, you know, especially in supply chain, there's only 24 hours in a day and they're like, well, how can I create, achieve more? Well, you can get more business, but if you don't have the staff to support it, then you're not really going anywhere and potentially um, you're going out of business. Yeah. And I, and it's not just really the bodies, it's also the data right? When you outsource and you work with a company like yours, 
you can not only get the talent that you need to fill some of the gaps within the business, but you're also gaining the data that you might not be able to get internally. And we're going to talk about technology in a, in a minute, but walk me through how you work with your customers. I mean, do they come to you with a specific challenge that they need addressing? Like, we're overworked, we're in a mess, how can you help us? Um, and then how do you work with them to build a support package that best suits them? Because I'm sure that there's a lot of conversation and digging into what they really need versus what they think they need. Uh, great question, yes. People, well, over the last couple of years, the biggest biz, biggest challenge we've, we've heard is, is the talent pool. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. People, jumping ship or wanting more money or just not finding the right resources in their local market. Um, so that's been, been the biggest concern is, you know, how do we have those bodies to, to allow us to scale our business? Because most companies are, are growing at a thousand percent and they can't find enough resources and then train those resources and then make sure they come to the office. Cause again, we're, we're covering around the clock support. So a lot of these times, these companies, like another company that came to us recently, a, a large top 20 forwarders said, Hey, we're having so many air shipments, but we can't get updates to our automotive company, you know, timely. So right. we need um, track and trace updated instantly. And we need emails replied within 15 minutes, but we don't have someone after hours after 5 PM or on the weekends to do that. So they come to us and saying, Hey, cause, cause we, co- we cover 365 days a year and we co- cover all time zones. So we're saying, yeah, we, of course we can do that. And we have the talent because we only hire people that with the specific talent in that background. And then we start providing that resource. So it's, it's a comfort level. Anytime you hire a new person or interviewing is getting people, you know, comfortable with that experience and, 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 and driving that behavior. But again, the talent pool has been a huge thing and especially the labor costs drastically increasing because we focus on the market in, in North America and Europe um, where labor costs have skyrocketed. And then most people, again, are finding positions paying 30% more above where they are. So it's, and we're at a fraction of that cost. Typically, people are getting five to one, five people with us for, for one cost, the person that they have. Wow. Wow. And um, I think, you know, being able to, I mean, I think also the training aspect, right? The time to be able to train. I mean, if you think about supply chain professionals, and you think about being in supply chain, there's so many things going on right now. Everybody is overworked. Everybody is working after hours. And, you know, I think just even to find time to train somebody, if you do find the right talent, is also a bit of a challenge as well. And where you can come in because you've already got the people trained or you're training your internal teams yourself as well. Are you there? Yeah. Th- yes, that's, that's, that's really been a huge issue is finding the time. So typically what we do when we start up is we say, take one process, take a person, Let's do a web, like we're doing right now, a podcast. Let's do a web demo where we're seeing their screen and walk us through what you're doing, you know, do iterations of that pilot and then let us record it. And then we're going to create something called an SOP, a standard operating procedure. We take ownership of that, that document. It's kind of like free consulting for them. And then we give them the SOP afterwards and we go through iterations to make sure it's, you know, meeting their, their requirements. And at the same time, it kind of goes to what you said. We're also giving sharing best practices and saying, hey, did you think about doing this in the process to adjust? Because typically when you sit down, if we take, you know, um, Sarah and Bob and we sit down and watch their process, they're probably, probably doing it differently. So we're trying to create best practices that are followed. And then the other big component that we do with that, because a lot of organizations don't have SOPs in place, is creating um, metrics, driving, driving best performance, continuous improvement. So we take key performance indicators such as cycle time, um, how many files per day we start working through metrics and getting organizations to start thinking uh, differently. Cause a lot of organizations, unfortunately um, they're measuring their, their top line, their performance, their revenue numbers and their expenses, but they're not looking at um, operational performance metrics. And we start to ingrain that in the organization's mind and they start to think differently. Um, we have organizations come to us and then, then we start asking questions and some of them are not prepared for it. So we actually have to stop and then step away and say, Hey, when you have the time to sit down and commit, cause it's, it's, it's an evolution because um, if they really want to scale their business and grow and truly become, you know, successful, um, these are some basic fundamentals that some organizations are not, whether they're large or small, don't have in place. And we help them do that. Absolutely. So not only are they filling the gaps that they need, 
they're um, outsourcing to you and finding the talent and your training, but then they're also getting consulting, which is amazing. I mean, everybody needs a set of eyes on the outside, like the outside looking in to just sort of figure out what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and where there can be more efficiency. And so talk about the integration of your services then. Is there software that needs to be implemented? Do you work within a customer's existing systems? How does that work? Because I'm sure, you know, at this point, there's also a piece of technology uh, or there's a component of technology that, that comes into play. Well, we work as an extension of their business. We, we are our CargoWise partner, which a lot of uh, people within logistics use. It's, it's a recognized yeah. global international. So we're one of their partners and we use their system extensively with most of our staff trained and certified in that. But the, the way we work is typically when we first start up, we're basically looking at their process and just becoming an extension and then using everything they use today. However, when they come to us and start showing us some of the software they're using, we give them recommendations on things that we say, hey, because some of the companies are saying, hey, we're not able to track X, Y, Z. And we say, well, have you looked at these, these tools that are out there and available that we see that are best in class and a lot of organizations are using? And we give them ideas of things to do, which yeah. might generate more revenue or make it more efficient. I love that because again, you know, a lot of companies are, and especially supply chain professionals have different challenges that they're going through, but they don't necessarily know what solutions are on the market. I mean, that's what we do with our podcast is really highlight companies like yours and companies that are really filling the gaps and um, have solutions to, to those challenges. So supply chain professionals can really take some time and figure out who's out there to help them. And so um, I like that because that's really a support that supply chain professionals are needing. So glad to hear that. Do you come up against nervousness from potential customers when it comes to the thought of moving forward with an outsourcing strategy? What are some of the most common objections or maybe challenges and how do you answer those? Yeah, definitely. There's always hesitations. Um, one of the biggest ones prior to COVID were the back office is going to take my job from people. But it's yeah. more or less a, an education saying we're not really taking your job. We're supporting taking the work you don't necessarily like to do, the small administration work and allowing you to do the value add work and focus on that. Um, but now with COVID and people getting more comfortable with people working remotely and podcasts and Zoom and all that information, people are comfortable working with anyone around the clock anywhere as long as they're achieving and meeting their customers' expectations. But the way we kind of get away from that concern is we say, guys, we're only taking one process to start. Let's right. walk through it. Let's walk. Let's crawl before we walk, before we run. And we go through those iterations. As I mentioned before, we do a web demo. We put together an SOP and then we kind of, you know, work through it to put metrics and try to meet and ex um, exceed expectations that their clients have and say, how can we better service your clients so that they're getting to where they want? And how do you grow that? Because a lot of people don't have time to go out and really understand their customer because they're focused on the internal operations. And we give them that, uh, that metric. And then again, once we achieve that one process, we move on systematically into that next. So it's, it's again, it's a, it's a gradual crawl before we walk, before we run. Yeah. And I think, you know, given that example that you provided earlier about having to get back to somebody within 15 minutes, you're really taking some of the, um, the, the things that the supply chain professionals need to do on a daily basis that get into get in the way of maybe them really being able to flourish <laughs> and really do their job to 100%, right? Because if they're constantly having to answer somebody within 15 minutes, but they've got a really pressing project that they have to work on internally for their internal customers, it's kind of a struggle as to <laughs> what do we do? And then they have to decide which one's the priority. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong. But being able to have a support like Xenov to be able to take some of those really important details um, off their plate, I'm sure would would really help them with that. Yeah, one 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 thing in particular that's become the most important, especially in, in the supply chain market, is the spot rates. So yeah. right now, organizations are losing out on the fix. The carriers are saying we're going to stay on the spot, <clears throat> and what customers are doing is they're sending emails to several people uh, talking about the importers, and whoever's the first to respond is typically getting the business. Right. So typically world we take prior to COVID, someone would send an email to, if it's an ocean or air, they'll send an email where they're working with an agent office overseas, let's say Indonesia, and then they're waiting to the next morning before they get the rate out. 
So there's maybe a 12 hour to 24 hour lag based on it. Like you just said, they might come in the office, but they have to do their priority and then they don't get to something to later on. Whereas we have a second and third shift, we're getting at same time zone. If there's questions, we're going back and forth with them directly during that time zone instead of waiting. Because again, if you, you wait, you get the email and then you have a question and it goes back. So now you're two days out. Mm-hmm. We're working on the same time zone. And typically we're getting the customer the answer the same day. So when they come in first thing in the morning, it's in their inbox already done. So right. it kind of circumvents the <clears throat> back and forth. So sales support and an account management and control tower has been a, a huge, like you just said, um, we have projects and then you have all these other important tasks. Um, we're working on those things to give them that, that support and extension. So it's like one salesperson has 20 uh, he-men, she-men working on their team to uh, like an octopus arms all around doing all their yeah. busy work while they focus on the, on the core so that they're working with a customer to get the updates they want, but they're not working on, you know, cause a lot of companies today are still working on Excel. They're still working on WeChat. They're working on what's up. So we take all that information and compile it in, as you were talking earlier into a dashboard so they can have the data to drive the business and make business decisions that, that are agile, but also meet and exceed expectations. Nice. I love that. And that's such a great example. And we're going to get into case studies in a little bit, but I love how we are sprinkling in different examples of how people can work with you. So let's talk about your setup, because unlike a lot of offshore companies that offer outsourcing services, you have a North American office, an American executive staff. So talk us through that. Why is it important and what benefits does that bring to your customer base? I think they find it important to have someone locally that they can meet and, and, and speak to. So a lot of organizations want to have a comfort level where they know somebody. So uh, back office has that bad terminology when you call someone customer service on speaking to someone in Asia, whether it's India or wherever, and they have an accent, and someone just gets angry with it, whether it's with the airlines or so forth. Um, we want to make sure we have representations across all different regions we're supporting and you know have that experience working firsthand with my background and some of our other partners. So we've been with these organizations to drive the change and we can speak and relate to what's going on in the world, not just COVID because global is a global image, but we can talk about, Hey, the presidency, what happened or what's happening with infrastructure in the U S or it's, it's, it's anything in sales. It's just a personal relation to understand what's going on um, in that part of the world. So it kind of builds that rapport and more trust. And it, it it, it goes a little bit faster again because of COVID because we're able to, um, like right now we're having this conversation, typically in the past, people wouldn't answer their cell phone. They would right. call their office and then you would call, call, leave a message. You'd send an email and it might take a week or two, but now people are um, answering their phones and they're talking about their kids and their family and their vacation. And there's like a per- personal life balance going on right now where people are actually happy, kind of who would have thought, even though uh, President Biden came out saying, hey, we want people back at the office now. So there's a, there's a, a threshold of balance going on. But at any rate, people are talking about their pain points and how, like one of the things we say is how can we make your life better? Like if you could do anything, what do you want to do? If money was no objection. And a lot of these people saying, if it's not work, I want to go with my family on a vacation, a trip. We're like, okay, great. So how can we help you do that? And it's getting people to instill the trust with us that we can take on functions that they, they don't have to worry about where they can focus on family time. And then if there's core things for their business, going to meet the customer at a conference like TPM where you were there or other conferences coming up, they, they can attend those conferences in, for a week and not have to worry about all the operations going on behind the scenes. Yeah, it's so true. And I was going to bring TP up, TPM up as well because their baseline or the, the tagline for that particular event was Relationships Matter. And everything that you just sort of said there and the reason why you know, having a base close to home um, for a lot of these organizations really is about that relationship piece and how relationships I really find right now are more important than I think ever before. Supply chain really has been focused on their people um, for a long time, but relationships and collaboration is, has really been a focus in conversations that I've been having as well. And leading up to that, you know, you're dedicated and you call yourselves customer obsessed. And I'm increasingly hearing that sentiment from brands on the show, which is great to hear because I don't think it's always been that way. So why is a customer focused approach so important to you at Xenov? I mean, you just talked about how important relationships are, but as internal, um, as an intern, like internally at your company, why is that customer focused approach so important? And do you agree that it's a growing trend within the industry? Why do you think that is? 
if you behind you, you have, you have a sign that says collaboration is the future of business. Mm-hmm. So th- that's a great saying. But again, if we're not collaborating as a team, so we, we look as a, look to be an extension of their business as a, as a partner. And we drive and treat it as though it's our clients. And if they're not growing and they're going out of business, so are we. So what we're saying is we look at it as though it's our own family owned business. How do we help you accelerate that growth? How do we help you growth projectile even bigger where you can do things you couldn't believe do? Uh, if, if you're not personable and relating to people and, and driving that relationship, as you're just saying to, then 10 other people are calling you to go on a date and they're going to yeah. go with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> That is a very true statement, especially in freight right now. (laughs) I love it. So taking a step back and looking at the industry with a wider lens, what have you seen from your perspective and that of your customers over the last couple of years? COVID and other disruptions have really ripped through the industry. Has that kind of changed the way you've worked with your customers? Has it changed the services that they've been asking for? COVID's definitely helped the back office industry our organization and several as people become more comfortable. Cause again, prior to COVID people are saying I have an office with a hundred people and I would go to like large carriers who are our customers today. And the offices are empty. The only typical right. thing that we're seeing in, in, in the offices is a warehouse. And that's because they have to touch and move the freight, but anything else that you don't have to physically touch, unless it's moving the freight physically on a plane or a truck or going to a customer's office, which most customers still don't want to see you. Cause as you saw a TPM, there was a good audience there, but it's not what it used to be in the past. Um, majority of our customer pool didn't go. Maybe some did, some didn't, but it allowed us to reach out to companies that didn't have the comfort level to meet, to understand that we could do everything and anything anywhere in the world. You don't have to be in LA, New York, or anywhere in the world. You can, you can accomplish it as long as you have fast internet, which has been an issue on this call a little bit from my end, um, a phone service. And people that are properly trained that are dedicated to meet expectations and you measure their performance daily, weekly, and monthly so that they know they're achieving and you reward them based on that. Um, people are fully, they're fully invested. But again, um, they, you have to put together SOP, standard operation procedures, where you're measuring performance and you're tracking metrics to achieve more and make sure the dedication is seen, which hasn't been seen before. And I think a lot of people didn't realize their true potential as you start to measure stuff they're realizing holy crap you know so the last five years i've been doing it wrong and i could have made millions of dollars more so it's driving you know more operational excellence and then people are seeing the the real value that they, that they they can achieve absolutely and so what about the trend towards increased outsourcing it's definitely something that has grown exponentially over the years but recently driven largely by the disruption that we've been talking about in this interview, you know, there have been more conversations around bringing things back in house or keeping things local. I mean, there's a lot of conversations that are happening in supply chain right now, a lot of moving parts, a lot of things to think about. What are your thoughts on that? What are you seeing? Do you think outsourcing will continue to be important, but perhaps businesses will be more strategic with the partners that they choose to work with and the area of business that they focus on? So the biggest issue I still see, and I, I think it's going to continue to see, especially based on some of these political things I'm seeing from our government and just in general, is talent pool. People yeah. have changed their behavior. They're in control now. They're dictating whether if they're talented people that work hard, they're deciding if they want to go to the office or not. They're deciding where they in the world they want to live. Uh, they got used to over the last two years, hey, I'm in Cancun, Mexico, on the beach, but I'm still achieving. People are working much more efficiently. Like I, when I used to work for Panalpina and I lived in Manhattan, I went to New Jersey, I commuted three hours a day. Wow. So imagine if you could take that three hours or 15 hours a week and put it to work. People yeah. are actually working more and becoming more efficient and achieving more and spending time with their kids growing up. I mean, I have three kids and I get to spend more, I mean, more time with them is the best thing in the world. People usually go through life. Like, oh, I wish I had more time to do this. We're, we're allowing people to uh, achieve that. And if you can have the right talent do that and save the organization 50 to 80%, 50 to 80% um, the, the CFO and the board jumps up and down. Oh my God, where do I sign up for that? And then they get super excited. So whether they're small, medium, large, every organization wants higher profit margins, whether they're private organization, whether they're a non-for-profit, whether they're publicly traded, but they, they want to achieve excellence. And the only way they can do it is 
having the right team partners, whether it's outsourcing or whatnot, um, provide that source. And, and, and right now, if you're not treating your employees well and paying them super well, um, you're losing the game. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier in our discussion, when we're providing five bodies for one and we're achieving five times the amount, think of like saying if you're going out to play basketball and you shoot every day I go out to practice and shoot a thousand times like Kobe Bryant, you know, and I'm making baskets versus someone that's practicing once a week. Again, we're doing five times the amount of work of other people and we're doing it around the clock. So it's, yeah. it's a machine that we're just grinding through. And those organizations we've been partnering with, growth has accelerated to the exponential. And those that have not, because some organizations that come to us say, hey, you know, we want to do it internally. But the problem when they do it internally is organizations still move slow and their time to set up, ramp up and do what we do takes some months to years versus the organization saying, let's turn the switch today. Or we sometimes organizations we work with, we collaborate where they have their own internal resources that do BPO and we do it too simultaneously, but it gives them the chance to accelerate now because if you're waiting, you're losing out. Your, I mean, like one example, and this is a bad one, and I'm not putting down expediters, but their cyber attack was very detrimental to their business where they lost tons of customers. And so all these other organizations, whether they're brokers or forwards, their volumes started scaling up drastically and they didn't have the resources to support it. Right. So if someone comes to you, like, I mean, this was a godsend for most organizations, but really bad for expediters. People could have, could have doubled their business overnight if they had the resources. Right. They weren't prepared. The ability we do as a back office is we say, you can scale up or down with us in an instant. Yeah. So if you really want to, you have that potential. Yeah, and you can capitalize on different uh, challenges that come up in the industry as well. So t walk me through who your ideal client is then, right? I think you work with uh, SMEs all the way up to Fortune 500s. What does that look like for you? And if I'm sitting in the audience, how do I know if I'm the right client for you? Um, ideally for us, we're looking for someone that wants a long-term partnership. Um, we're not looking to be virtual assistants where someone comes to us and they want someone 10 hours to do their, you know, constant, you know, given we want repetitive tasks that are, that are ongoing where we can provide value. Um, people are the greatest assets and we provide great people and service to meet those requirements. So if we have, if you have high volume turns and lots of stuff going on, regardless of the time zone, and again, we're working 365 days a year. So um, people need stuff on, on Christmas or weekends or whenever we're working and, and driving that. So someone that wants to partner with us and grow as they grow. If they're not looking for that, then, then we're probably not the right fit for them. So it's not really necessarily a certain size or a certain industry then? No, we, we, we have some organizations that come to us that have, they want 50 people. We have some organizations that say they want 10 and some that want five. So uh, some of our forwarders are, you know, top 10, some of our ocean carriers are huge. So it, it doesn't make a difference to us. It, it's more or less the relationship as we talked about before, where they, have the passion to really want to grow and do it together. I love to hear that. Collaboration is the future of business. But now it's time for the case study. And as we've already talked about, you really are customer focused. And so you've already provided some really great, great examples already. But paint us a picture of how you've worked with one of your customers. What was the challenge that they came to you with? Which of the services were they working with you for? And what was the impact or ROI of that particular uh, offering? I'm going to give you one just in general, because again, we don't share any of our information on what clients we partner with just to protect them. And we sign non-disclosures just to protect people and their data. So just to, we'll say company A, they wanted to come in and they saw there was a need for back office. And I'm just going to fast forward and go back in a second. It, it took them six months to onboard with us. Wow. Typically our on onboarding is two to four weeks Okay. for 90% of our customers. They were, they were getting in their own way. So, you know, who do we got to get on a call? And they kept changing their mind what process they want to do. So sitting down and understanding from an, an executive management, what, 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 pro, what pain point do you have today? And typically the best is what pain point is low hanging fruit that you can fix and see value release immediately. Mm -hmm. So this organization kept going back and forth and changing their mind what they wanted to do. And we kept saying, just get on a call and let's do a demo and, 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 We'll do the SOP because, again, they didn't have their own SOPs in place. They, some, they said they did, but when we looked at it, you couldn't give it to a five-year-old for someone to understand. It, it didn't make any okay. sense. Uh -huh. so, so after back and forth over these several months, we sat down and you know, did a process. They were happy with it and documented and then started moving through. And then we went from two people to 20 people in a matter of, of two months, but it took six months just to get that 
that crawling going on because organizations are, the, are the getting in the way of themselves. Some of these massive organizations have too many different levels where there's different decision makers. And, and funny enough, one month of, of the delay was them just setting up an email account for us because we set up email accounts with the organization. And it took them another month just to set up a, a log into one of their, their systems. So the checks and balances for some of these organizations, uh, they put systems in place to help, you know, control and put security. But if it puts you in the way of not achieving when something changes, uh, it slows you down and it, it, there's something wrong and you need to fix it. Absolutely. So what was the ROI? What was the benefit that they saw from working with you in that particular scenario? So in that scenario that we have, and again, it was very high level, was big. one of the things they wanted is they wanted instant response time around the clock for their customers. So we, we put in three shifts, seven days a week. Uh, their customers were getting delays or getting responses within 24 to 48 hours. They started getting responses within one hour. So their customer satisfaction, which was their most important, was, was, was you know, through the roof because they got more right. business. And then they, they were able to increase their profit margin in their business by another 30 to 40%. Amazing. Those are really great numbers. And it just goes to show when you make that kind of shift to that response time and really focus on the customer and what they're actually needing from you and providing what they're asking for, what it can really do to your business. Now, let's get to the last question. What does the future hold for Xenoff? What are you guys working on? What can we, you know, what can we wait to see from you over the next year, maybe two? Well, we're continuing to strive to improve ourselves and find ways to ever improve. And one thing we're looking further into to continue with that, besides just people, as we talked about technology, is something called RPA, Robotic Process Automation, where we can continue to add another element of change to our process. So we have people doing it, but also if there's a way to orchestrate a, a process where we can get a, a computer to help to do it, it takes it to the nth fold. So if we're doing 100 with the people, we can do 500 with this, this system. We're looking other ways to um, improve our metrics even further because, again, every time we look at stuff, you can throw bodies at it, which, which is great. But also there's other processes where you want to automate certain aspects and we're looking to automate because, again, yes, we want to do the work. But if there's ways to do it more effectively, we want to make sure our clients know that and we work together to collaborate um, to, to achieve that to make it much better. Absolutely. And that is so interesting. I mean, I personally have a team who are based all over the world, but as a digital brand, I mean, it really lends itself to that way of working. But I think that when it comes to big business, there's always that element of fear around outsourcing, around that loss of control, loss of quality, or potential exposure to risk. But I think that that's a big mistake. I mean, the potential in outsourcing is huge. It can really have a very positive effect on your efficiency, productivity, and ultimately your bottom line, as we have talked about in this episode. And if you choose a dedicated and customer-focused partner like Xenov, I think that will have given you know our listeners a lot of food for thought today from what we've spoken about. So if you want to find out more, you can check them out at Xenov, Z or Z-E-N-O-V-B-P-O.com. A massive thanks to Joseph for joining me today and to the team at Xenoff BPO for making this episode happen. 